John, first of all, thanks for being here and talking to us. My um, pleasure. I want to start by getting your reaction to recent comments by U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Um, in an op-ed in USA Today, he basically said the maximum pressure campaign is working in Iran and it's weakening the regime. Is there any sign that Iran has changed its malign behavior um, since the maximum pressure campaign by this administration started? Uh, none at all. Uh, but in politics, um, never underestimate the capacity of people uh, to delude themselves um, and to uh, believe what they want, want to believe. After all, this is Secretary Pompeo's policy, so he's not going to say it's not working. Um, he is hardly, what would you call, uh, a um, disinterested judge in, in, in a case like this. So he has the policy. He says it's, he says it's working. Um, the reality is you, you have to may always make a distinction between what is true and what you want to be true. And in this case, uh, since Secretary Pompeo wants his, poli his policy to be true um, he, or to be working, he says, it, he says it's working. He's hardly, as I said, he's hardly uh, the most disinterested judge of that fact. So the Trump administration withdrew from this landmark nuclear agreement unilaterally, and their argument was it does not address Iran's ballistic missile program, it does not address Iran's destabilizing activities in, in the region, uh, and, and they had many, many issues with this agreement. President Trump called it the worst deal ever, a disaster. Do they have a point that any f agreement between world powers and Iran should include Iran's ballistic missile program and its destabilizing activities. Well, they might have a point, but that, that's all smokescreen. Um, the argument, uh, um, President Trump's uh, problem with the, with the nuclear agreement, the JCPOA, I don't call it a deal because deals are when you, when you buy and sell used cars. Uh, but his problem, his problem with the agreement has nothing to do with what's in it. Um, he could negotiate another deal, which would be objectively 10 times worse, and he would say it was better because he did it. The problem is his obsession with his predecessor. It's obvious. Uh, he is obsessed with Obama, uh, and the specter of Obama just haunts him every day. Every day. And so he so has sold himself, and this worked for him uh, in the election campaign, as the world's greatest negotiator. And whatever deal anyone else made, particularly his pre uh, his predecessor, he was going to do. He was going to do better. And the, as far as the contents of the deal, I don't think he cares. I don't, I don't think he cares less. I mean, when they negotiated it, Secretary Kerry, uh, Secretary Muniz on the American side, and, and others, uh, and the Iran and the and the Iranians, um, they knew very well what they were doing, and they deliberately limited the scope. Of the uh, of this, because once you start introducing other things, you make reaching agreement that's much that much harder. Um, uh, a colleague of mine once said, uh, "If you negotiate everything, you agree on nothing." Hmm. Interesting. Let me move on to Foreign Minister Javad Zarif. Uh, the Trump administration recently sanctioned him, but they insist they are still seeking diplomacy with Iran and some kind of resolution, but yet they sanctioned the man in charge of diplomacy. What is the reasoning? What is the thinking? What is, uh, what is it that they're trying to accomplish with this move? Um, I really don't know. It, it's very unclear beyond um, feeling good. Um, I don't, there, there doesn't seem to be any purpose. There doesn't seem to be um, any, go um, any goal. Um, perhaps um, in the case of in the case of former Mr. Z uh, Mr. Zarif, uh, he's collateral damage for uh, Trump's uh, Trump and company's dislike of the nuclear of the nuclear deal. After all, uh, he was one of the main nego negotiators on the Iranian side. After all, the the administration can't do anything to Obama. They can't do anything to uh, Secretary Kerry. They can't do anything to Secretary Muniz. Uh, but they can do something to Zarif. You know, 
Can I say it in Persian? Dasishun be Obama ne mirese. Meli dasishun be Zarif mirese. They can they can do something to Zarif. Right. They can do something to Zarif. So he's a, he's a, he's a symbol of something that Obama did. Uh, and they do, it's not, you know, maybe it's not personal. I, I don't know. The other problem he has, the other problem I think they have with him is that he's, he's just effective. Mm -hmm. He may have a bad case. He represents a government that I don't particularly like and not a lot of people like. Um, but he, argue, he does an uh, effective job as a, uh, as a, prof as a professional. Um, and that I think riles this uh, uh, this uh, this administration. They don't they don't like it because he shows them up for, frankly, um, the amateurs and the incompetence that they are. What do you make of reports that um, Zarif was actually invited to go to the White House and meet with with the U.S. president, and he declined that invitation, and then a few weeks later he was faced with these sanctions. I don't know if Zarif himself declined it or he probably had to refer it. Was that a it. mistake? If it's true, should Zarif have gone to the White House? I don't know. I, I, under those circumstances, it's hard to see how he can accept, uh, um, how he can accept. Um, because um, the administration, he knows the, the administration would most likely say uh, it would not remain secret. It would be pu it would become public. The administration would point to this and say, "Look, our um, policy of maximum pressure, our policy of sanctions, our hostility to Iran is working," and they have uh, they have given in, in the sense that their foreign minister now has agreed to uh, agreed to come to the White House. They would use that as a symbol. I don't know why the Iranians would buy into the, would buy into that. What needs to happen, Ambassador, to get Iran and the United States on the right track? The simplest thing, uh, and it's the most complicated thing at the same time, is to get back to the practice of diplomacy. You know, the U.S. and Iran haven't practiced diplomacy with each other for 40 years. The U.S. and Iran have shouted at each other. We've, we've yelled at each other a lot. We've made accusations. We've called each other called each other names. But the practice of diplomacy has somehow been forgotten. You know, it's like a toolbox that sits in the garage and gets rusty. Nobody knows how to use it any, uh, anymore. We've got to go back to it. So, for example, name calling. Got to put that aside. I noticed, for example, the State Department's official uh, Twitter account. Call, used a very vulgar name um, against Zari, uh, um, uh, against Zarif, called him Malikesh, which is, if you know, in Persian, is not very it's not very polite, and it has some even worse undertone, uh, undertones beyond its literal mean, beyond its literal meaning. Well, you ask yourself, that's not diplomacy. Uh, this is an official U.S. government statement that uses this very coarse name. Now, somebody has to start has to um, provide adult supervision. You know, we're not in Lord of the Flies here. Uh, there has to be adult supervision. Somebody has to say, no, no, that's not, accept that's, that's not acceptable. Words like phrases, words have power, Asya. We all know this. Phrases like change their behavior, mm -hmm. that's not diplomacy. And death to America. Death to America diplomacy. is not it's diplomacy not either. And on the Iran, this plays, all this stuff plays into the most virulent strains of anti Americanism in Tehran because people can say, look, we told you you can't trust these people. We told you this. We told you, we, we told you that uh, um, Ayatollah Khomeini was right when he said, why do we want to, why do we want to negotiate with America? What does the wolf have to negotiate with the sheep? Um, that plays into it, and the Iranians on their side have also have not been very skilled uh, at their uh, um, at their diplomacy. And so, ba basically, what people need to do maybe is sort of step back, take a deep breath, and say, "How do we do this differently? How do we how do we talk to each other?" I mean, sending Rand Paul, for example, to New York to talk to Zarif that's that's a good idea, that's smart. But where do you go? It, one meeting like that doesn't change the dynamics, doesn't change the atmosphere. How do you, fo how do you follow it up? And the idea that it would, from that one meeting, you get Zarif coming to the White House as though nothing has changed, uh, I think that's a, that's a delusion. Uh, let me move on to Bolton and 
Giuliani, Ru Rudy Giuliani's relationship with this group that calls itself an opposition group. Many inside Iran have deep distrust of the MEK. They consider it a cult. Giuliani and Bolton very, you know, have taken payments from this right. um, group. Members of Trump's inner circle, though, ambassadors, seem to believe MEK could potentially become the country's future leader. Well, I guess if you like Jonestown, and if you like the Khmer Rouge, you would love the MEK. Uh, that's the way I see. That's why I, I see them. I mean, if it wasn't for why are they so was, hated by Iranians? If you go to because m Americans don't know anything about this group, um, besides the fact that they used to be on the U.S. terror group. Well, they one, were taken off. the Iranians know who they are, and know what they, and, and know what they are, and all this talk of democracy uh, and secularism they know is a, is a, is a smokescreen. I mean, uh, the, the current, the, the Islamic Republic and the, the uh, people ru ruling it, you know, they, they may be brutal and inept and, rep uh, and, re and, and repressive, uh, but they, perhaps they kill by the hundreds. Uh, MEK uh, is Stalinist, basically. I mean, they, they would kill by the millions. Um, and there's no so question about it. The other like thing was, the other thing was uh, they fought on the side of the Iraqis in the war. I mean, how can how can the how can Iranians the forgive betrayal. that? That's right. If even if you don't like the Islamic Republic, even if you hate the Islamic Republic, you're not going to accept you uh, uh, you're not going to accept that. And the idea that these these people are a viable alternative is absolutely ridiculous. Now, um, if it wasn't for the people like Bolton and Giuliani and others um, who shill for these guys. Um, they would be just an odd footnote of history. I mean, this strange, you know, this, this, this strange group which has transformed itself six, six or seven times from, and, and now is this cult-like uh, business with parts of Marxism and Islam and feminism and cultism and cult of the leader and so forth and so on. And it's just, uh, uh, it would just be a footnote. But the other part of that's interesting from the American side is they've got, they not, not only have support from the Republic, from the right, they have support from the left. I guess basically it's money. Uh, let me move on to the 1979 revolution. You were a young diplomat, you had just arrived in Iran a few weeks before the embassy takeover happens. Tell me what went through your mind. Did you know what was happening? And despite being held, in that embassy in 1979 for 444 days, Ambassador, I don't detect one iota of bitterness from you. Bitterness, bitterness against whom? Against whom? Uh, the Islamic Republic, the students who took you hostage. Oh no, I don't like them very much. <laughs> They're not my favorite people. I don't, I don't like the, uh, and I don't like the Islamic Republic very much. It's not a place I would choose to uh, uh, choose to live. Not that I, not that many of my friends or your compatriots or my relative, my 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 relatives have had much of a choice. As to where they uh, as to where they live or what kind of gov what kind of government they uh, they had, but remember, I mean, my my roots with Iran go back a long way. They go way back before uh, before the revolution, back to 1962, uh, of all things. Before you were born, before before you, you were born, you were married to an Iranian. And my wife is Iran. My wife is Iranian, and very proud. I mean, she's very proud to be Iranian. She's she's not one of these people who goes around saying, I'm a Persian, I'm not an Iranian. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not an Iranian. As though being a Persian associates you with carpets and cats. Uh, I think it was- Caviar. And caviar. Maz Jubrani likes to say, it puts the purr back into Persian. <laughs> <laughs> back into Persian. No, she's very proud to be an Iranian, uh, uh, very proud to be an Iranian, very proud of her cult, very proud of this this great cult, this, this great culture and this great, uh, great well, civilization. It? And it's there and it's, you know, the fact that, a group of uh, a, a group of young people, students uh, did what they you know did what they did, um, and the fact that those people who were responsible, who should have taken action against them, but uh, but didn't, that doesn't change um, two thousand years of history and uh, um, and of civilization. I mean, if you look back at Iranian history, there have been some pretty horrible things that have happened, much worse. Um, than what the Islamic Republic has come uh, uh, has come up with. 
But did you know what was going on at that point? And tell me about your brief encounter with now Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, clearly way back when he wasn't the supreme leader. The revolution was just no. starting. So tell us a little bit more about that. I applied the Persian proverb, uh, uh, I cut off his head. I wanted to cut off his head with cotton, meaning uh, I had a point to make. I didn't abuse him. Uh, I didn't yell at him. It was tempting, maybe, to do so, to, to do so but what was the point? Um, so what we did was, um, maybe even without thinking about it, we fell into this um, Iranian, very Iranian interaction of host and guest. Mm -hmm. He was visiting me, so I was his host. And as a host, I had obligations to him. As a guest, he had obligations to me. So I insisted, for example, that he sit down. Um, I said I apologized that I had nothing to offer him to eat or drink because a host always has to, uh, uh, has to do that. Um, and he, I fell into the role of host and he fell into the role of guest because people are hardwired that way. And my point though was very serious, which was, look, um, I know how to take care of a guest in my home. This is my temporary home, but it's my home. Uh, you do not. You have abused thousands of years of your own tradition and culture uh, by mistreating a guest for whose safety you are responsible. Uh, now, Iranians, Asi, as you know, they're, you are, or they're, you're like us. I mean, there's no difference. People do good things, they do bad things, they do outrageous things, they do wonderful things. But one thing I had never, ever seen an Iranian do was to mistreat a guest. Well, what they were doing was outrageous. Uh, and I used the, I used the word uh, taruf, I used this word about um, uh, courtesy, uh, courtesies and customs, and I said, you have abused it. Uh, Iranians are hospitable people, but this is, this is disgrace, this is beyond the pale. I didn't use the word disgraceful, but he understood it. And I think, I think he's a smart person, I know he's a smart person, and he understood immediately. And that was shown on Iranian television at the time. I didn't know it. I didn't know it. But after I got out, people told me about it. And they said, you know, we really appreciated what you did. Uh, finally, Ambassador, um, a hypothetical question. If U.S. President Donald Trump called you up on the phone and said, Ambassador, you know Iran inside and out. You've been a diplomat. You've, you've served your country well. You're married to an Iranian, you understand the culture, you understand the politics, you understand the traditions, you understand the sensitivities. What kind of advice would you give the president if he asked you how this administration needs to change its strategy when it comes to Iran? First of all, he's not going to call me on the phone. Uh, it just, it's, just not gonna it's just not going to happen. Like it or not, um, I'm identified with the previous administ with the with the previous administration and you know that that is the enemy i mean iran may be may be an adversary but that uh, president obama is definitely uh, definitely the enemy uh, hasn't called me on the okay, but hasn't but say called he does. me on the, but say he does on, on the on the on the 1 millionth of 1% chance that he did i would say for uh, uh, first of all just just cool it um Iranians have an expression, it's not very polite, but you say to put one's rear end into a bucket of cold water. <laughs> what about just sanctions? Cool, just, cool, just, uh, uh, just cool it. Uh, and remember that sanctions, we have had Iran under sanctions for 40 years. Um, and the Islamic Republic is just as hostile as ever, hasn't changed very much, hasn't become more flexible. But don't delude yourself. And in the end of the day, talk of regime change, um, does, is not help, is not helpful. It just makes people more, uh, just makes people more defend, uh, uh, more defensive. I mean, the Iranians have gone went through that horrible war with Iraq. They did it essentially alone, um, and they f they f they can f when when their back is up. When people when like most people when people's back are up, they they get defi they get defiant, 
Um, and th don't delude yourself that more sanctions, maximum pressure, more isolation, this or that, uh, is necessarily going to be uh, going to be effective. And suppose it is. Suppose the dog, the dog that catches the truck, you know, the dog that chases the truck. What does it do if it catches it? Suppose um, there, the, suppose um, the whole regime collapses. Then what? Um, is it going to be any better? I mean, we have the examples. Uh, we have uh, some examples from um, around the region. Uh, that are not very hopeful. No guarantee that things are going to be any better. Um, and don't have any illusions that uh, your national security advisor friend, your national security advisor's friends in the MEK uh, are going to take over and be, wel uh, and, be, and be welcomed. God forbid if they do take over, that things are going to be any better. Uh, uh, things are going to be any better. So, you know, cool the rhetoric. I don't know, maybe fire your, fire your uh, national security advisor or, or at least rein him in, uh, uh, rein him in. Uh, but, uh, and remember that, you know, what, but this, this doesn't just apply to foreign policy or to Iran, um, that your words have power. And measure, uh, measure your words and try diplomacy. Um, it's, I know it's not in favor very much with this administration, but it works. All right, we'll leave it there. Ambassador John Lindbergh, thank you so much. You're quite welcome.